A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you're with me on the program today. We're going to be talking with our friend Laura Carno from Faster Colorado. You know, there's less than two weeks left in the uh, legislative session. Democrats are still advancing a number of gun control measures. The uh, House uh, and the Senate both working on various gun control bills. Maybe the biggest one that's still out there is the uh, ban on so-called assault weapons that uh, has cleared the House. It was assigned to the uh, Senate Veterans, or State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee back on April 18th. Uh, so far, not even a hearing has been held in that committee which is a sign, I think, that the uh, bill may be in some trouble, but Democrats are pulling on all the stops to try to get this to Governor Polis' desk. Meanwhile, you've got uh, sensitive places bills. You've got bills that would mandate liability insurance for gun owners. Uh, And earlier in the session, there was a bill that would have ended uh, the ability of school districts in Colorado to have armed school staff. Now, thankfully, that bill has been uh, defanged. Uh, and we'll talk about that with Laura Carno here in just a second. But make no mistake, the right to keep and bear arms is under attack in Colorado in a way that we simply haven't seen before. Um, there has been this you know, steady trickle of gun control legislation over the past, uh, say, uh, 12 years. But really nothing like the onslaught of gun control bills we've seen introduced in uh, Colorado this year. So let's talk about it with Laura Carno from Faster Colorado. Take a look and a listen. Laura, thanks for coming on the show. It's good to see you again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, I'm I'm just curious. Have you started looking for uh, real estate in Wyoming yet uh, <laughs> as a result of this year's uh, legislative session? Lord have mercy. Yeah, there, there are so many people here in Colorado, not just pro-gun people, but just people who are finding it more difficult to live here with all the regulations. We're looking at South Dakota, Wyoming, uh, Nebraska, Tennessee, Florida, Texas. So yeah, I've lost a lot of friends geographically for sure. Yeah. Well, hide your dog if you're moving to South Dakota, but, uh, or your goat too, I guess for that matter. Um, (laughs) (laughs) well, I guess as long as it's your dog, it's okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. You can keep track of your dog. (laughs) That's right. Um, I, so, you know, we are still watching, there's what you said, uh, seven days left in the session in Colorado, right? Seven days. Correct. It's uh Wednesday next week. Um, and boy, is everybody looking forward to it? It's been a rough one here. It has been, I mean, we've already seen a number of gun control bills, uh, get to governor Polis's desk. He hasn't acted on those yet. Um, but we're still looking at things like, uh, mandatory liability insurance for gun owners, uh, the sensitive places bill, which has been amended. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, that's got to go back, I think, to the House for a concurrence vote, but the Senate uh, approved it with some amendments. Or maybe it was the other way around. Um, and then the gun ban bill, right, which is uh, it's cleared the House. It is pending before a Senate committee. Um, it's been actually in committee for almost two weeks now and has not yet had a hearing, which I view that as a positive sign. Maybe they're just waiting until the last minute. But uh, I, you know, to me, if the votes were there, they probably would have brought that forward as soon as possible. That's that's kind of my thinking. Yeah, and and there are a lot of uh, gun groups here in Colorado um, who kind of have that same thought process. Uh, the Colorado State Shooting Association just put out a, a publication saying exactly that that um, perhaps the votes aren't there. Um, specifically pointing to. Um, Senator Tom Tom Sullivan, um, who your listeners might know, his son was killed in the Aurora Theater shooting, and he ran for office on gun control. Um, He's on the the State Affairs Committee that is supposed to hear this, and there is word at the Capitol um, that he is wavering on this and and says maybe at the federal level, uh, but I don't think we should be doing this at the state level. I know there's a concerted effort um, to call into um, for people, his constituents and his um, kind of purplish district um, to call into his office and um, and ask him to vote no. So um, that, that's going to be an interesting one. Um, best I'm hearing is people think it's 60, 40 going to pass. But, you know, 40 is a pretty strong number at this point with this kind of a legislature. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and I've heard speculation that uh, Governor Polis is uh, on the fence about this as well. This isn't really one of his uh, bills that he's been calling for. Um, and, you know, and it's interesting, Sullivan has, has been pretty public uh about his 
I won't say opposition because he hasn't come right out and said, I'm voting no, but about his hesitation. Right. right? Yeah. Um, but as you say, he's a gun control activist. Uh, you know, he's running a bill this year that would establish uh, merchant credit, emergent category codes for uh, right. gun stores specifically uh, and some other bills. So it's, you know, it's it's never a good thing when, you know, the fate of your civil rights rests in somebody who um, believes in targeting those rights. Um, but that's right. kind of where Colorado gun owners are right now when it comes to the semi-auto <laughs> right. ban. I, you yeah. know, I'm curious as well, because we just saw Tennessee adopt a uh, an armed school staff bill uh, signed into law by Governor Bill Lee. 40 hours of training. Um, you have got to get the unit the school's uh, permission. you got to be, you know, volunteer. you got to be vetted. Um, you have to pay for the training yourself. The, the anti-gun forces in Tennessee are acting like this is the worst thing ever. Uh, they're, they're, honestly, they're acting like every teacher is going to be required to strap on a, a handgun before they go to work. Um, Colorado lawmakers... Originally, this session, when this session began, Laura, there was a bill that would have done away with armed school staff in Colorado, right? Right, right. And and to even go back a little bit before that, this sensitive spaces bill originally included K-12 campuses, um, including the people who we work with at Faster Colorado, who are designated as members of the armed security team. And then that part quietly left the bill before it was actually formally introduced. And for 10 seconds, I thought, oh, th because they've looked at the success of the program and that there's, but no, that's not why. We were getting our own bill. So then this so-called school safety measures bill um, came out and I'll, I call it so-called because it wouldn't have made schools any safer. Um, that one, and, and, and by the way, when that dropped, um, we had no, other option besides to hire a, uh, a lobbyist um, to protect the interests of, of schools and our program. And um, which I never thought we'd be in a position to have to do that, but but we really did. And that, really, that tended, I think, to make all the difference because we got the school board association, we got the school executives association rural, uh, the Colorado Rural Alliance to come alongside us, which those things made the difference. Um, <clears throat> but was interesting, is uh, the at the end of the day, the um, committee chair it was it was before um, House Education. The committee chair gave the opportunity to the bill sponsor to withdraw her own bill as opposed to being embarrassed by watching it get killed in front of House Education, and uh, which is significantly majority Democrat. And um, and so actually, even though. They were doing this without testimony, everything. I went to the Capitol because I wanted to see this. And uh, it, it was a, a couple of minutes um, speech that she gave. It was, I'm going to use the word bitter. I don't think that went too, goes too far. She said at the end of the day, nobody liked the bill and um, she was going to bring it back, which we believe she, she, that somebody, if not her, will be bringing that back. Um, and we're in for the long-term fight. But you mentioned Tennessee, um, Alaska, um, is working on a bill that would require schools to have somebody armed on campus, require. And so while the, the rest of the country is going one way, um, interesting to see, um, you know, Colorado still trying to get rid of it. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm glad that uh, that bill was withdrawn. Um, I, I was concerned as well because I was looking at the sensitive places bill uh, yesterday and Unless you read the fine print, it does sound like, uh, you know, armed school staff are, are banned. Uh, it's basically everybody else uh, is barred right. from uh, carrying on a, a K-12 campus. And, and campus carry, universities and colleges, um, those are also included in that sensitive places bill, right? So right. Yeah. What, would, what would that mean uh, if this bill passes? Would it be the end of campus carry? Yeah, so, um, and the quick background on that is that sensitive spaces had 20 some spaces like um, parks and movie theaters and different places like that. Now it's down to just three, which as you mentioned, includes higher ed. So, um, so the fine print there says that unless it's part of your job to carry a firearm, different language than the K-12 um, part of statute, um, but, um, our lobbyists and um, some attorneys I've talked to on the higher ed side say that it really is accomplishing the same things as the K-12 bill, which would basically say your university needs to approve you to be a member of the armed security team. What it would stop is um, people who are 
um, students um, from being able to lawfully carry. But what's interesting is um, uh, different than the K-12 bill, which federal gun-free zone um, makes it a, a felony, college campus makes it a misdemeanor. Does that change a lot of behavior if you're a student um, with a CCW or if you're a member of the staff or faculty that isn't an approved member, does that change their behavior? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's interesting that it's a misdemeanor. You know, and I'm glad that you brought up the punishment, which, by the way, I mean, you know, most most of the time when we're talking about gun control bills, the media rarely reports what the what the penalties for violating these laws are. Uh, and gun control activists really don't talk about that much either. Right. It's almost right. like, well, if we just put the law in the book, that that's fine. It really doesn't matter what the yeah. enforcement is. Magic. <laughs> but it's been fascinating to see this in Colorado because Democrats uh, are, are taking a very soft on crime approach this session generally. Um, they've turned away several bills that would increase the penalties for I think I, the one that I saw was, I think, sex trafficking. Um, well, we don't we don't want to, you know, increase the punishment for that. But like the gun ban bill uh, was originally introduced with no criminal penalty. Right. right. But there was a civil fine, I think, of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars if you were right. caught selling uh, one of these you know, banned items. Um, I think they lowered that down. I don't know if they've. They, they may have attached a very low level criminal penalty, like a citation offense to it. But I think now it's a seven hundred and fifty dollar fine. And that gets back to your your point. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's the rationale for doing this other than yeah. to say, well, we passed a gun ban bill. I mean, if you know, if criminals aren't going to be impacted, uh, if the punishment is so light that even a lot of frankly lawful gun owners are going to say, mm, you know what, it might be the worth the risk. Uh, I might right. go ahead and choose to violate this law because my personal safety is more important to me than, uh, you know, paying a fine or even getting charged with a misdemeanor. Right. W what is the yeah. point? Why not go another direction here instead of just, you know, well, it's just, we got to pass it just to pass it. Yeah. If only we could, if only we could be sure about their intention, um, because across the board, even, you know, outside of this gun control stuff, um, you know, introduction of wolves and all kinds of different crazy things here. I, it, it's really difficult to put your finger on this must be their agenda. Um, but when you look at the um, at the websites of all of these prime sponsors on all of these bills, the the first, second or third picture you see is that representative or senator surrounded by the ladies with the red T-shirts. And um, if you look at their uh, their campaign finance reports, you can see that they have um, donations from folks like that. And is it is it as simple as payback? I don't know the answer to that question. Is it as simple as in order to run in that district and you know some of these very blue districts, you must be more anti-gun than the, the next guy or gal? That that could that could weigh in as well because it is a little bit baffling. Yeah, it is. Um, so you know, I, I said uh, before we brought you on the show that you know, Colorado, we've seen this sort of trickle of gun control over the past 12 years. It's not like this is, you know, coming out of the blue, but this really is, th this year's session really is a change from what we've seen yeah. in the past, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. There was 14, I think, anti-gun bills and they weren't, I mean, a couple of them were, you know, sort of around the edges, but it, most of them weren't, um, you know, they were, there were and are because some are still in process. Um, I mean, virtual gun bans and um, carry bans and, and things that we look at and say, okay, this is really serious. This is a California, New York, Chicago kind of thing, not a Colorado kind of thing. And, and I don't, uh, certainly Colorado has gotten more blue over the years as there's been a lot of in-migration from places like California. Um, but I don't think we are as blue as looking at that state legislature would have you believe um, there's this huge percentage, like 70% of the people at the legislature, the Democrats at the legislature got there by vacancy committees, um, meaning, you know, a, a small group of party insiders selected them when somebody else left. Um, and that is always going to skew toward, you know, further right or further left, depending on the party. Right. And um, so that could that could also have something to do with it. Um, and, and a couple of those folks are being primaried by the Democrats with somebody who's a more centrist Democrat, I guess. Um, so that whole dynamic is going to be very interesting to watch over the next year or two. I, I wonder if we might actually see a, a pro-gun Democrat emerge from some of those primary challenges. 
I mean, it, it could be, we, we had them in the past in Pueblo, we've had them in the high country um, where it's more of a Democrat area, but people came out of ranching and uh, that was the, you know, guns are very much tied to, to ranching. Um, so yeah, it's, it, you and I have been talking about Colorado for the last, you know, 11, 12 years. And it's fascinating to watch the changes. Not, not good, fascinating, um, but fascinating for sure. <laughs> Definitely fascinating when I'm living, you know, 2,000 miles away. Yes. <laughs> yes um, exactly. Although Virginia's had some changes too, uh, right? You might be looking at uh, South Dakota. I might be looking at West Virginia here before long. Um, there you go. I, you know, so I, I, I'm curious as well, what is going on with Faster Colorado? When when there was this effort to um, to take away the ability of districts to have armed school staff, obviously, as you talk about some of these organizations and institutions said, to hold on time out. Did that prompt any districts to reach out to Faster Colorado and say, hey, we've been on the fence about this. We we really do want to have this in place. Or did it have the opposite effect? Did it have a chilling effect? Uh, did you see a reduction in uh, the amount of calls and interest in uh, trying to adopt these policies? Yeah, I, I think what's going on at the Capitol was a little more neutral from that standpoint. It, we didn't have anybody say, we got to do it while we can, or we got to get out of it. There was really none of that. It's school school shootings out in wherever in the country tend to drive that behavior more. Um, we were very communicative with our, all the schools that we have now on a sometimes several times a week basis as things changed at the legislature. Because what, what was interesting is when this came out, the number of schools who said, sign me up to testify. Um, we'll organize parents to testify. We had um, one private school who um, was going to have its um, civics class uh, come testify and sort of follow the bill and stuff like that. And um, so there was a lot of that sort of legislative interest and engagement. Um, and now that it's gone, it's you know sort of everything um, uh, back to normal. Um, there might have been a little on the edges of we were going to you know add some more people to the program, but before we pay for classes, we'll wait and make sure it's still going to be legal next year, kind of thing. But yeah, very very little um, impact from that standpoint. Okay. So there are still going to be uh, plenty of districts around the state where these policies and practices are in place uh, next year. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. We're at 41 districts in Colorado at this point. Wow. That's amazing. That, that work with us. And we know that there are um, some districts right on the borders that might cross state lines to get to a closer uh, training class or something like that. So we know there are more than um, 41 districts represented, but that's that's the number that we're working with. That is fantastic. Well, I hope that the number continues to grow. Uh, I'm glad to hear that uh, this policy is secure for at least another few months uh, until the yeah. next session of the legislature. Yeah. And uh, I would love to have you back on after the session wraps up. Maybe we could do a, a post-mortem and kind of take a lay of the land uh, with all of these bills sure. still you know, up in the air at the moment. Yeah, sure. That'd be great. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Well, listen, thanks for all you do, Laura. I, you know, again, this is something that you 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 took this on because you saw a need, right? And I don't think you knew at the time when you said, hey, something somebody needs to do something. Nobody else is. I guess I'll do something. I'm pretty sure you didn't realize the extent of your involvement and and how much this would uh, you know shape your life. But um, you're doing amazing work. You are hoping to keep kids safe and secure. You are uh, really you 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 are a, a true inspiration um, as an activist. Uh, and as somebody who, you know, cares deeply about these things. So thank you for all of the work that you're doing. Well, you're very kind. After, after getting this idea from Faster Saves Lives in Ohio, um, I am just a crazy enough person to do something like this. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's um, you know, never, never thought we'd be involved, um, you know, legally, um, legislatively like we are, and uh, never thought that when there are school shootings that, you know, people like me would be called to go on national media um, to talk about there is a solution and things like that. So yeah, certainly I, I would have had no idea if I, if I was predicting this 10 years ago, couldn't have predicted this. Well, I'm glad that you're still sticking with it. And I look forward to catching up again very soon. Laura Carno with Faster Colorado here on Barry and Arms Cam and Company. My thanks to Laura for joining us on the program. And we are going to be watching very closely what's going on in the legislature here in the waning days of this year's session. 
Before we get to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day and our recidivist report, let's talk about this for just a second. At the very heart of our democracy lies a principle that we hold sacred, free speech. It's the cornerstone that supports every freedom we cherish. But in today's digital age, discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives, leaving many feeling voiceless in conversations that are crucial to our financial independence and security. That's where wealth protection research steps in, armed with a mission that's never been more critical. Wealth protection research is not a financial advisory firm. They're defenders of free speech, committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Wealth protection research tirelessly seeks out financial experts. They're the voices that are challenging prevailing narratives, especially as we navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth Protection Research has created a 2024 Election Wealth Protection Report. Now, this free report highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas that mainstream media won't touch. Listeners can get a copy completely free. Just text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech and the importance of financial freedom, then act now. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 Election Protection Report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas the establishment doesn't think you can handle, and to take control of our financial destinies. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy. All right, uh, turning our attention to today's Armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. Now, this is not a true recidivist report, because this is a first-time offender, but it is still a what-the-heck-are-you-thinking sentence for what is a pretty serious crime. Uh, Here's the headline. Former FBI agent sentenced for federal gun charges in uh, Fayette County. Yeah, um, this was in Kentucky. A uh, former Central Kentucky FBI agent sentenced for federal firearm charges after he illegally took guns from an FBI storage office, according to court records. 45-year-old Michael Van Alston was sentenced to, you ready for this? Three years probation on March 28th for obstruction of justice, as well as possessing an unregistered firearm. Now, I don't know why he wasn't charged with theft. He was originally charged, I guess, with possession of a firearm made in violation of the National Firearms Act, possession of an unregistered firearm, as well as unlawful transfer of a firearm to an out-of-state resident. He uh, took a plea deal in November of last year. He was able to delay sentencing again until just a few weeks ago. Uh, where the judge very quietly handed him a probationary sentence. Van Alston was accused of removing two guns from a suspect's home, transporting them to an FBI office for storage, and then later removing them from the evidence room and taking them to his home. He also gave one of these guns, described as a multi-caliber rifle, to a man identified in court documents as M.H. and told him, quote, don't let anybody else know the source. Of that firearm. Uh, Another gun was allegedly destroyed by Van Alston and thrown away. FBI spokesperson Katie Anderson confirmed in November last year that Van Alston no longer works for the Bureau, as one might expect. But, I mean, come on. Taking guns that were seized in the course of an investigation to your house, giving one of them to... I don't know, an acquaintance, a friend, a buddy, family member. We don't know who M.H. was. And then destroying another gun, at the very least of which was evidence, may may very well have been perfectly legal for that individual. Don't We don't know. But, I mean, at the very least, this demolished the case that they were working on, right? You, you've now destroyed evidence. Um, I just can't believe. Well, I take that back. Unfortunately, I find it completely unsurprising that uh, Van Alston would get a probationary sentence for something that arguably should have resulted in some federal prison time. All right, you know, some folks just get all the breaks, and I guess if you got an FBI badge, it makes you a little bit more likely to get them. All right, uh, today's Armed Citizen story from Houston, Texas, where a personal injury attorney was the victim of a burglary at his uh, southeast Houston home. Now, that lawyer says he didn't use a gun to protect himself and his family, but somebody else in the home did. Um, Chi Nguyen is a a well-known personal injury attorney in the Houston area. Houston Police Department told ABC 13 that officers responded to Nguyen's residence 
on the southeast side of the city on Monday. They found an intruder that had been shot. Uh, Wynn doesn't live at the home, but his family does. According to police, Wynn wasn't the individual who shot the burglar, but a witness said he did hold the suspect down until officers got in the scene. Francisco Saldana, who uh, is a nearby neighbor, said, I, I'm in my apartment. I just hear gunshots. I look out the window. Wynn and his partner, Anthony Push, uh, known for their uh, slogan, we push, you win. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Um, Saldana says he didn't see what happened during the uh, when the shots were fired, but he did see the aftermath, which included uh, when holding the suspect down uh, in the middle of the street. Saldana says at first he was holding him. He didn't want to go down, but then eventually I think another guy came and helped pull him down, and they got on top of him. Houston police say the suspect, 40-year-old uh, Rene Blanco, taken to the hospital. He is expected to survive his injuries. Saldana said, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. It's the middle of the day. You never really think like something like this is going to happen. But he said, you know, telephone row is getting kind of crazy now. You don't know what to expect. You have to always be on your toes out here. Uh, I guess so. We don't know if this was some sort of, you know, targeted attack. If they knew that this was, you know, the home of the uh, personal injury attorney, maybe a former client, somebody uh, associated with the uh, former client. We don't know at this point. Uh, what we do know, however, is that... Uh, According to police, well, actually, I guess according to a family member, the uh, burglar tried acting as a delivery driver to get inside the home. Um, now facing burglary charges, recovering from his injuries, and the individual who shot that burglar, apparently not facing any charges at all. All right, finally today, our good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Two off-duty nurses in the uh, East Bay area of California who were in the uh, right place and had the uh, skills and training to save a man who collapsed on a basketball court uh, in the middle of a game. It was uh, just, you know, kind of a pickup game. It wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, high school or uh, NBA or anything like that. It was the all-out sports league, I guess. Um, and in the middle of the game, one of the players just drops to the floor. Uh, Doreen Thrash was there at the game. She's an off-duty nurse, or she's a nurse at uh, with uh, Kaiser Health. She said, when I saw him go down, he did not look good. So she immediately ran onto the court to help. She said, all of a sudden, he's not breathing. I feel no pulse. We just jumped in and we started CPR. There was another off-duty nurse from another uh, nearby hospital who ran down onto the court as well, started uh, chest compressions as Thrash was performing mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Um, the gym, thankfully, had a portable defibrillator as well. Thrash said, there's a button you press. I pressed the button. It shocked him right away. And right away, he woke up. His eyes opened, and he was breathing. It's amazing. Um, again, the uh, individual in question expected to make a uh, full recovery. Gave a thumbs up as he was taken to the hospital by paramedics. Thrash said, I felt elated. And I said, what a blessing. What a blessing. There's no words for it. I pray that he continues to heal, and I pray that nothing like that ever happens to him again. Well, I, I do too, but uh, thankfully, again, at least in this case, the uh, man had a couple of guardian angels courtside, ready and willing to uh, lend a hand and a breath to save his life. So, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Um, Doreen Thrash, the second unidentified nurse, we thank you for your very, very good deed. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Barry and Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program as always. I'm looking forward to being back with you again tomorrow. Don't forget to check out BarryandArms.com. In the meantime, however, we're keeping you up to date on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. And if you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member as well. Just go to BarryandArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP or VIP Gold membership. We're going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, an ad-free experience, the ability to comment on stories. If you become a VIP Gold member, you'll be able to do that across the Town Hall Media family of websites, access to all kinds of great stuff. Plus, maybe most importantly, you will be playing a crucial role in uh, making sure that our independent pro segment of journalism continues to be produced. So thank you again for your support. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.